Good day, everyone. We're continuing our conversations with uh, Global Hepatitis Elimination Champions for 2020. I'm delighted to be joined uh, today with uh, Dr. Brian Conway of uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. He's done some remarkable work in expanding access to hepatitis C uh, treatment for marginalized populations, for, for particularly for persons who inject drugs. So, um, uh, Brian, hello, and I look forward to asking you a few questions so that all of us can learn more about you and your work. Well, thank you very much for this uh, great honor, and I very much look forward to, uh, to sharing with uh, everyone uh, the journey that has led myself and my group to where we are today. Great. Uh, first of all, just, you know, I, I, in looking at your biographical sketch, I noticed that uh, you started off in HIV as, you know, as I did way back in the 80s where HIV was a, an emerging pathogen and we all had a lot to learn throughout society, including medicine, about how to respond, you know, to this uh, uh, in, emerging infectious disease. And then, you know, you moved over and um, moved into hepatitis. And I was just very interested in how you, you know, made that journey. What interested you in hepatitis so that you would expand your scope of work? And what do you think are some of the lessons learned from HIV that, you know, you found valuable in, in, in making that transition to working in hepatitis? Well, I had the privilege of seeing some of the first people that were diagnosed with HIV when I was doing my medical residency uh, back east uh, in Montreal. And this was a stigmatized, vulnerable group of individuals that not only required the best of us in terms of our medical knowledge, but the best of us in terms of designing systems of care that would reach out to individuals who were naturally marginalized, not only by their diagnosis of AIDS, but by what had led to them acquiring HIV infection. So when I moved to Vancouver in the mid-1990s, there was an epidemic of HIV infection in the inner city among injection drug users. At that time, individuals who had that as a risk behavior were not necessarily being offered the life-saving antiretroviral therapy that was becoming available to them. So one of the ideas we had was if they were on opiate agonist therapy, we could co-administer antiretroviral therapy along with opiate agonist therapy and allow them to benefit from the HIV treatments the same way as everyone else could. That was pretty innovative at the time and it led to some very interesting and positive results. We quickly realized that hepatitis C was significantly more prevalent than HIV in that community, but the treatments were complex and poorly tolerated. As soon as better treatments became available, it was a natural switch for us to use the same infrastructure of outreach to make it available to that population. And that's how we kind of added HCV programs to the HIV programs that we had already developed. Yeah, very, you know, very well. You know, one of the things I find in, you know, the hepatitis C, it's remarkable that you know, we have these um, relatively, you know, short duration curative treatments, really the first time in the history of medicine that we can cure a chronic viral infection, and now we have that. And, the, you know, and the, even after only about five years of them being available, the prices have declined dramatically where you really can truly make... Um, elimination possible even for marginalized populations but it, you know it's, sometimes it seems like it's it's gotten so easy that people feel like it's just going to take care of itself it's, what do you think is the you know, is that the case in 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 the vancouver or uh, are people recognizing you know that there are still you know different partners that have, need to come to the table and 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 what what's really the next steps to really take full advantage of these true miracles in medicine that we have available to us now. Many of the inner city populations are largely disengaged from care. They are not seeing healthcare providers for any reason and they feel marginalized by issues that are largely social in nature. They have no money, they have no food, they have no home, and as a result of all of those things, they've lost hope, and they don't wish to engage in the system that's a necessary prerequisite to them receiving the life-saving hepatitis C treatment. So I think one of the key interventions that we have to design is this process of taking someone who is disengaged and engaging them in care, 
providing them with the things that are important to them, be they social, psychological, addiction-related, or medical. And when such engagement has been secured, this is the ideal context into which to deliver life-saving hepatitis C treatment. So it isn't as simple as writing a prescription for a certain number of pills over eight to 12 weeks. It's a process of engagement, of partnership, and then making certain that both the individual who is to receive the medication and we who are prescribing it have concluded that this is the right time for this to happen, but it's gotta be built. It's not something that's gonna happen spontaneously. And that's the challenge that we face in trying to eliminate hepatitis C over the next decade in this vulnerable inner city population. Yeah. Now I can understand those social determinants of health being you know, very important for this population. And you know, it's important for us to bring our expertise to the table and for you it's you know, years of uh, expertise in uh, clinical management diagnosis while we're also recognizing these other social determinants that have to be addressed. So, you know, as far as the time in your day, you know, how do you, uh, you know, how do you use or balance uh, time for your clinical work and then, you know, um, contributing to these other solutions that you're speaking of, uh, either in, as part of uh, committees or organizations or, or even on an individual level? Well, I think it's important to balance program design and evaluation with uh, clinical care. Trying to work with a population with such complex needs requires very careful planning. I'm very fortunate to have a team of 15 individuals that I lead that are working together to accomplish these very important goals. So we design the kind of interventions in the community, trying to meet people where they are, and the unique tool that we have used is this community pop-up clinic where we will, over a period of a half day, go into an area, go into a location where the individuals that we're trying to reach normally seek services, either emergency lodging, emergency food, emergency legal counseling, and so on, and try to understand over the course of a half day what the needs are for up to 20 or 30 individuals, design a plan to meet those needs and recruit them into a multidisciplinary long-term program of care. And within this program is where we deliver HCV treatment. So the partnerships we have to establish are with each and every organization to try and establish common goals that can be met in the long term meet with the directors of opiate substitution clinics so that we can provide hepatitis C treatment in the context of care that is already being delivered, and with government and health authorities to try and achieve some programmatic goals that will achieve hepatitis C elimination at the level of a larger jurisdiction such as a province of Canada. So all of these partnerships must be built. You can't just show up and say, I'm here to provide hepatitis C treatment. You have to understand the needs of the community, the needs of the organizations, and governmental needs, and try to use these programs to better meet these needs and provide more and more hepatitis C care and treatment to the population that needs it. That's fantastic to hear. Um, it, are people uh, in these uh, communities uh, in Vancouver, I think it's uh, particularly East Vancouver, um, are, are, has sort of the word gotten out through word of mouth or other means about the availability of these therapies? So are therapies either sought after or at least well received when they are offered? Well, we're very heartened that once we've built the engagement that is the necessary prerequisite, I think, for an individual committing to hepatitis C treatment. They take it, they are very proud of the accomplishment that they have achieved of getting cured of their hepatitis C, and it gives us the opportunity to intervene in a number of other areas, including the underlying addiction. But what we find most satisfying is people just knocking on our door, saying, I'm a friend of Joe, and Joe just got cured of his hepatitis C at this place, and I want that too. So there's clearly word of mouth at a very individual level that is helping to grow our program. That's great. I, uh, 
Yeah, while you're on the line, I get to um, explore some anecdotal evidence with you, which I've you know, heard from some uh, providers of treatment for people who inject drugs, that there's actually some empowerment with cure, that people feel like, well, if I can get control of this, maybe I can take better control of other issues in my life, such as my addiction. Is, is, do you, have you seen that uh, as well, or is that um, uh, you know, just anecdotal that's not always uh, shared um, universally? No, we've actually done a very nice analysis of our data to try and evaluate the effect that we have had on the addiction behavior. In a particular analysis we conducted over the past 18 months, we were able to calculate the number of opioid overdose-related deaths that we should have experienced in the cohort of patients that we are following. And it was between 75 and 80, and we found less than 10. So we have probably saved dozens and dozens of lives, or I should say that the individuals that we've had the privilege of taking care of, have, we have, we've empowered them to make decisions for themselves that are life-saving with respect to opioid overdoses and their consequences. So I think this is, this is something where we, we designed the program, obviously, around hepatitis C, but it's about engagement, it's about multidisciplinarity, and it's about being in it for the long haul, playing the long game, and helping individuals take better control of their lives after they've achieved a cure of their hepatitis C. That's great. That's really exciting to hear that it's had that impact on, on people's lives. And as you correctly put it, you know, them taking control of their own health in that way is really, really uh, rewarding to hear. Uh, I guess two other questions come to mind before I ask you to just to fill in any other blanks that uh, I've, uh, I've left in our conversation was, um, you know, one of the um, innovative uh, approaches in Vancouver has been uh, directly observed uh, uh, sites for people who are injecting so that there can actually be someone there to guard against overdoses and, and other unsafe behaviors such as uh, needle sharing. Um, just let us know how your program interacts with that uh, facility in, uh, in Vancouver. Well, just to underscore the importance of these sites, as they were closed down or their capacity greatly reduced within the midst of the COVID pandemic, the last two months have been record months for opioid-related mortality in British Columbia. We've done such a good job at controlling COVID here. There have been twice as many deaths in our province of opioid overdoses over the past couple of months as there have been deaths due to COVID over the entire period of the pandemic. So these institutions, these supervised consumption sites play an important role in addressing the possible consequences of street drug misuse. So I think interacting with these sites has also been a key for our program to offer individuals the opportunity to go beyond just using under supervision and making sure that this particular act of using will not have negative consequences, trying to encourage them to make other decisions to take charge of their lives. So this has been an important partner in the evolution of our program over several years. Excellent. And also, I was very interested to get your thoughts on um, what I call cure as prevention or treatment as prevention. How do you fit in HCV therapy, you know, into the um, um, you know constellation of services, if you will, to really um, help people um, either you know, practice safe injection behaviors or you know get into the treatment they need to stop their addiction. I mean, what's the timing of that? Um, you know, how do you um, engage their you know needle sharing partners so that you can sort of protect them? with a uh, ring of, um, of protection, if you will, and those kinds of strategies. Very interested to hear how you see treatment fitting into a prevention of transmission. I think that the points that you raise underscore the importance of having a programmatic approach that addresses engagement and not just hepatitis C. All of these discussions can take place once a conversation has been initiated around the needs of the individual that we are serving. Their first need is very seldom 
getting treatment for hepatitis C. It's getting more money from the government. It's getting more and better housing. It's establishing food security. And in that context, we can discuss the fact that once we have done all of these things, to be able to keep the progress that has been made, safer addiction behavior, engagement in addiction care, is a prerequisite to not losing housing. It's a prerequisite to us being able to address their many other needs that at that point become hepatitis C. So all of these things need to be viewed as interrelated. In this population in particular, treatment of hepatitis C goes well beyond the simple writing of a prescription for pills that are generally speaking very easy to take and highly effective. It must include all of these aspects to find its true and lasting meaning. That's such a great way to end our conversation. Uh, it's, I think it's very evident uh, as to why uh, you know, you're being honored you know, with this uh, Global Hepatitis Champion you know, Award. I mean, you really are a, a, true, uh, you know, a true gem for, for Vancouver and are really, have, you know, really having you know, tremendous impact on improving health for, uh, for the population there. So um, just wanted to make sure, it, do you have any other closing remarks that you wanted to, uh, to give to make sure that I you know, fully, you know, fully gave you an opportunity to highlight uh, uh, you know, what you think is important? Well, thank you for these kind words. And I would say that the COVID pandemic has had a particular impact on this population from one day to the next in the interest of public health, a number of the structures on which they relied to live from day to day were unavailable to them. As we build the new normal, the better normal of the COVID pandemic, let us pay attention to the needs of the inner city and have specific programs that are aimed at this particular population to reintegrate them as part of the pandemic response and to resume the life-saving programs addressing hepatitis C and other essential needs that have been suspended for several months. So that's a challenge that I think we should all embrace and face together in the coming months. Excellent, thank you, we certainly will. We look forward to working with you on, on uh, hepatitis and how we can improve the health for these marginalized populations. Thank you again. Thank you very much.